uh, uh, it's going to be hard for me to call you Jimmy Deck, Jimmy Deck. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, everybody's going to say what they want to be called. And the, here's, my, here's my demand. Uh, I'm going to do this uh, the first time today. And so I expect it to kind of uh, crash and burn. But next week, I expect it to be a sparkling success. My demand is that within one to five minutes, you say your name, uh, and then you either do a show and tell, or you ask a really great question that is um, context appropriate. Does that make sense? Okay, a show and tell, or a question that is appropriate to the context of a bash programming class. All right, stick your thumb in the air when you're ready to go. All right, Corey, you're first, and then you pick who goes next. Okay, Corey uh, is my name, and go ahead and call me Corey. I don't have a fantastic question or for tonight, so I'm going to pass on that. I'm just looking forward to learning some Bash stuff. I guess we'll go with Jimmy Dax since he's next on my Okay, hopefully I can be heard now. How do I get my, uh, I don't know if you can see me, I'm trying to change my profile. Anyway. I can, I can see you. You can see me? Okay, Beautiful. good. All right, well, I don't know how to do a show and tell. If I could easily share my desktop, I'd do some quick bash script to share something about myself. But um, yeah, I don't know how to do that at this point. So I'm here to learn bash. Yeah? It's, it's at the bottom of the screen. Mm. Oh, There's okay. A green button named share screen. Oh, hey, that was easy enough. Look at that. Uh, cannot, cannot start share. Somebody has not been supported yet. Oh, Waylon, because I'm all right. Oh, okay. Sorry, man. Yeah, it's all right. Uh Oh, it just went dark. Anyway, I'm looking forward to learning bash. I've been using it for a long time. And before that, um, I was using corn shell. I only bring that up because I brought Dave Wilson, a corn shell book to add to his library just for giggles. And, uh, yeah, there you go. So let's have some fun. All right. You have to call Robert since he's. Oh, right. Robert. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Uh oh. Robert, your microphone is not working. No. It's going to have to chat no. session it. All right. Well, we, we love you. We'll, uh, we'll hear from you next time. Maybe plug in a USB mic. Well, what's funny is that I'm hearing myself through rich. Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. All right. That was the introduction. So we're going to do that again next time. Um, it will we'll, we'll go around. You say who you are, what you want to be called, and you do a show and tell or ask a question. Um, and that's how we're going to go. That's how we're going to come in. And that's also how we're going to go out. We're going to have an outro as well as an intro. Um, and that takes us into the materials. Here's, let me see if I can share my screen. Hopefully mine works. If mine doesn't work, we're in trouble. Um, I just want to share my whole desktop. There we go. Can you see my whole desktop, everybody? All right. And we're going to jump into the materials. You know that I keep the materials in GitLab and this is the project. So if you think of uh, stuff to improve the materials, um, submit a pull request here. There's a, there's a little contributing guide. It's basically this, uh, if you're pretty familiar with Git, send me a merge request. If you're pretty new to Git, uh, then just put in an issue. 
uh, that's over here in issues. And when you click on issues, there's a big button. Um, oh, you have to be signed in. Otherwise that doesn't work. Let me, let me get signed in. Cause I need to be signed in anyway. Um, Come on, David. There we go. There we go. Usually I'm already signed into this. Sorry about that. All right. So there will be a new issue button. Uh, so if you're new to Git and you have an idea for how to uh, improve this class or you have a question or you have a way to um, uh, solve a problem that is significantly different than what I've presented, uh, add a new issue and do the appropriate attachments and you can put it in that way in English. Um, but if you're a Git expert, Go ahead and just send me a merge request. All right, going back to the files. Uh, so that's contributing. Um, the idea list, I kind of use that for inspiration from week to week. Um, my intention every week is to take three simple problems that I think are well suited to bash scripting and then I'll show you how I would solve those problems using a bash script. And um, then I will open the lab for a half an hour and then we'll do outros. Uh, the outros will be about 15 minutes during which we will uh, share the solutions that we came up with to what I did. Um, and you'll already have seen my solution. So uh, if you, um, hopefully you improved on either, either you improved on it or you found some other uh, slightly different way to do it or you came up with a question. So again, it's the same thing. It's a Q and A or it's a um, show and tell rather or a question at the end. All right, so session zero was that demo session that I recorded on Pi Day and posted to YouTube. This is session one. The questions or the problems rather that I've come up with for today, I only came up with two, but solving one of them requires some setup. It required a um, body of material to work on. And so creating that material became the third problem. So these are the pieces for today. Um, Sysadmins sometimes have to patch systems and clean up log files. So those are the two problems. Uh, and programmers, me in this case, sometimes have to write programs to create crap to use to test their other programs. So in this particular case, the third problem became, how do I create some example log files that I can then use my log file cleaner upper to clean up? So going to the, uh, the first thing, wouldn't it be nice to have a patch script that you could use on any system? We're gonna write that. Um, as a sysadmin, uh, I highly recommend that you do a monthly patch and reboot cycle. Um, it used to be, well, it still is in, in, in some corners of the universe, a point of pride to have long uptimes. Uh, long uptimes, are silly in my opinion, because your system, your system's boot configuration can deviate significantly from your system's running configuration, and that's dangerous. So I highly recommend doing a monthly patch and reboot or at least a quarterly patch and reboot so that your system's running configuration is highly similar to your system's boot time configuration. If you think that a service is enabled and it's not enabled and you get a reboot at an unexpected time, you may find yourself doing troubleshooting at an inconvenient time. 
If you schedule monthly service windows, you get to decide when to do that troubleshooting and decide uh, when to resolve those boot time issues. If you don't and you go for the long uptimes, then you're going to be troubleshooting whenever the gods decide that your server should reboot because, uh, because there was a power failure or whatever uh, other unexpected event. So does that make sense? Uh, not that necessarily you agree with it, but it makes sense why you might want to do a periodic patch and reboot. Okay, so uh, that's what I've chosen. I, I believe that uh, um, short lifetimes and short boot times, short uptimes uh, are good. Uh, everybody's heard the saw about uh, cattle versus pets. Um, but everybody has uh, some pets. I recommend that you patch and reboot your pets. Um, with your cattle, you can use imaging to um, do your maintenance. So you can have a patched image and bring it up and, and do a green-blue deployment. Uh, we can talk about that during the Q&A session afterward, if you like. The tools that we'll be using today are loops. Uh, I'm going to use while read and um, I'll talk about uh, for in versus while read when we get to that. Um, I generally will choose while read for very long lists and for in for very short lists. We're also going to do a little bit of globbing, a little bit of brace expansion. We're going to use touch, find, and command substitution. So those are the those are the features of Bash that we'll be using. Um, I'm going to try during the, this whole class not to teach two features, but rather to take common problems, solve the common problems, and then I'll uh, start out with and, and, and delve into the tools as we hit them. Hopefully that works. Um, it, it might result in too much new stuff being introduced during the, during the class, uh, and it might end up that the class is too hard because of that. Uh, I will depend on you guys to give me good feedback on whether this class is too easy, too hard, uh, too fast, too slow, too what. Um, I will depend on you to tell me from your own perspective how well this class fits you, whether it's uh, sufficiently educational and sufficiently fun. Um, I want it to be challenging, but I don't want it to be, um, I don't want it to feel like a chore. I don't want it to be painful. I want it to be um, a, uh, the, like a game of mastermind where it is hard, but it's not too hard. Okay, okay. With that, uh, I'm going to dive into the demo. I know I'm a little bit early, but uh, this will give me a chance to um, go deeper with the code. Um, we're going to start with this one. How do I fully up update any Linux system without knowing ahead of time what package manager it uses? The solution is... And this, this should be a nice basic one. This, this should, every, anyone should be able to do this solution. Um, at least that's my thought. Um, it's just a bunch of if-thens, and it depends on the which utility. Let me make this bigger. This is, unless, it's, unless it's already sufficiently. Is it, is it perfectly uh, legible to everyone? All right, then I'll, I'll, I'll leave it the size it is. Um, so what I'm doing here, uh, the solution that I'm doing is, uh, I'm running which to see if a particular package manager is installed. The most modern package manager out currently is DNF. And so I'm doing newest to oldest, roughly newest to oldest. Um, and then I have to do a little special uh, dance at the end, but uh, I'll get to that when I get to it. 
I'm throwing the output of the which command away. So this is a this is a regular redirector, right? What does this ampersand in front of the redirector mean? That's that's this is a shortcut and it's a bashism. Um, there's another way to phrase this. So this bit means um, throw away standard out, right? So if I were to say two greater than ampersand one, um, that might be a familiar construct for everybody. Two is standard error, right? And so if I send two to ampersand one, where does that send uh, standard error? The same place that standard out is going because ampersand one is standard out. So this says send, send standard error to the same place that standard out is going. Well, there's a shorter way to say that as long as you can depend on bash. And since this is a bash programming class, I decided to use this. It's less portable, but it is more terse. It's more, uh, it's shorter. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking the output of DNF, or which DNF rather, and I'm throwing it in the garbage. I don't care whether the system is able to find DNF or not. What I care about is the exit status. So let's do this in a shell. If I say which DNF on this system, I don't get any output but I did change the exit status. To get the exit status of the last command, run echo dollar, um, echo dollar question mark, which by the way, always changes to a zero on echo because echo always succeeds. So you need to, when you do the echo dollar question mark, you need to do it right after the command that you're trying to measure. So, You'll notice that true always succeeds, false always fails. So any uh, program that succeeds exits with a zero, any program that fails exits non-zero. Non-zero means some sort of a failure mode. So what we're doing here is we're depending on that. We're depending on that exit status to drive this if then. Whenever which DNF uh, exits zero, I know that I have DNF installed. Whenever which apt exits zero, I know that I have apt installed. So does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so what I've done is I've taken what I know about uh, the available, the package systems that might be available on various systems, and I've built a bunch of if thems. And I'm getting rid of that. Uh, I'm getting rid of that output because I don't care about the output. Um, well, I meant to. I meant to write this in front of you, and instead, I'm I'm going back to the one that I already wrote. Um, do uh, Do you guys want me to continue with this deconstructive way, or should I do it building it from scratch? Okay. All right, uh, all, in, all in favor of continuing deconstruction, put your thumbs up. If you'd like to see it built from scratch, put your thumbs down. All right, that's unanimous, very good. Um, I'll go ahead and continue to deconstruct in that case. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read the rest of this program out to you. I think that, that that pretty much defines all the elements that are going on here, which determines whether a particular external is present. I could also have used type. Um, type will allow you to figure out uh, that something is an internal as well. So uh, type, if you do type with something that doesn't exist on the system, you still, I don't know if it still drives the exit code or not. Yeah, it still drives the exit code. So I could have used type, I chose to use which. Um, type is actually, uh, Type may be a better driver for this if then. So when you go to write yours, uh, maybe consider trying type because uh, it still drives the exit code. That's really the important piece here. Um, and type starts a little higher in the stack. It looks for in 
aliases and internals in addition to looking for externals, which only searches the path for external commands. So um, maybe a little bit of an improvement. Uh, you, you may be able to improve on my methods with some uh, better shading and color. Um, that's, a, that's a reference to a strong bad, but I couldn't think of the name of the shading that is um, where the um, strong sad improves on strong bad's methods. But uh, maybe I'll look that up while you guys are doing the lab. Uh, so if DNF is present, if DNF is not present, I'm going to fail this whole block and go down to the next block. If DNF is present, I'm going to run this bit here. This bit here is a non-interactive and full update of the system that is appropriate to DNF. On a zipper-based system, I'm doing, the, I'm, I'm doing the same check. Is zipper present? I don't care about the output so I, or the errors, so I dump all that in the bit bucket. If zipper is present, I do the command that fully updates the system with zipper. I couldn't remember as I was writing this uh, whether zipper has a dash Y switch or not. Um, I'll uh, actually, we'll, I'll start this in the background. Um, one way to check your uh, programs or your scripts rather uh, for portability is to use Docker. Uh, Docker can give you different distributions very quickly uh, because it brings them up in a container instead of bringing up a full uh, virtual machine. I think I might have an OpenSUSE image. I don't remember how to get my script into it though. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll, I haven't practiced that and I don't want to fumble in front of you, but what I'm gonna do is um, for my show and tell during the outro, um, I will show you testing, somebody remind me, I'm gonna show you testing um, this zipper, this update script uh, in an OpenSUSE VM. Uh, container rather, Docker Docker container. All right, so if, if zipper is present, I exit zero and I run an update with zipper. If it's not, I fall through to the next one. Um, and, and I always fall through to the next one. Notice that there's no, this is not nested. I'm, I'm gonna run all of these on every system, which is why I have to do this little special dance down here. Uh, I'll get to it in a second. So if apt is present, I do an app dance that updates the whole system. I also do an auto remove with apt because I have filled up a lot of boot partitions with old kernels and auto remove will stop that from happening. Uh, there's a yum tool that does the same thing, but it's not installed on every system that has yum. And I think that DNF automatically cleans up old kernels where apt, at least on the systems that I've been on, doesn't seem to clean up old kernels, at least not automatically. Uh, so auto remove has been my friend on apt based systems. So let's say I'm on a yum based system. There's two kinds of yum based systems. There's yum as a compatibility layer to DNF. And I know I'm going to hit this check again, even on a DNF based system, because I don't have exit zero in any of these blocks. Maybe I should have put exit zero in every block, but, but I didn't do it that way. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm doing two checks. I'm checking for yum. And if that checks, I'm checking for a failure to check for DNF. So if yum is present and DNF is not present, this, that's what this bang does. It reverses the result of that check. This double ampersand is what causes these two to chain. Got that? Okay. So if yum, if, if yum is present, now I do the next piece and not DNF, then do a yum upgrade. So that's my solution for 
how to patch up any Linux system without knowing whether or not it's a, um, uh, without knowing what kind of a system it is. So I'm gonna go into my Git repo. Uh, I'm going to clone, I'm not gonna clone the repository. No, I am gonna, I'm gonna show you guys how to clone the repository because I want you to clone the repository so that you'll have my answers for reference. Um, but in order to do that, I gotta get in my repo. Get remote dash V, there we go. And now I can show you the command to clone it if you don't already have a clone of it. And it goes like this, git clone. And I keep all of my clones in a place because I don't wanna back up my clones. Um, I back up a lot of things, but I don't wanna back up my git clones because they're already backed up. They're backed up in GitLab. Uh, so I keep all of my git clones in a git sub off of my um, home directory, which is excluded from backups. So this is how you clone the bash programming repo. Hopefully you have a key pair authorized in GitLab. Um, if you have any trouble cloning the bash programming repo, let me know and I'll help you work that out. Okay, I'll uh, I'll help you troubleshoot that. We'll we'll do um, we'll do. Are you having it too? Yeah, I haven't tried yet. Okay. If um if you're having trouble, you may have to request access to the project here. All right. Let me uh. Let me try. I'm going to grant that to Jimmy DAC. And that makes you a developer, um, which means that you can commit to anything but master, I believe. So you can actually do branches and stuff. That'll be cool. Um, yeah, I'm going to leave you as a developer. Uh, so now try your clone again. All right, let's, we'll we'll give it five minutes. Yeah, maybe it's maybe it's out of date or something, um, or maybe you need to set up a key pair. Yeah, and if it if it doesn't work to clone it that way, um, there's another way to clone a public repo. Uh, let me go over to the repo uh, root. If you clone with HTTPS. Whoops, uh, I didn't mean paste, I meant copy, copy, there we go. Um, you can also clone like that. And uh, the downside to cloning with HTTPS instead of SSH is that you're cloning read only when you're doing HTTPS. Uh, so if you're not, if you're not planning to uh, try to co-code with me, then read only will probably be fine. Uh, that'll get you all of my stuff. All right, so I go into the bash programming clone. Oh, I'm already in it. And I see, oh, here's all those files that I was looking at at the beginning of class, right? Um, how am I doing on time? I'm doing okay. Uh, and I go into session one. Yeah, you didn't know that this was gonna be a Git class. <laughs> um, but uh, I think everybody has to know Git at this point. I think Git is like, um, uh, it's, I think it's kind of like breathing for the IT world now, uh, especially within DevOps. It's like you have to know how to breathe in and out and you do that through Git these days. All right, so we're in session one and I wanna see if my update any Linux, which it always amuses me that update any Linux sounds like any Linux. Has from the Eurythmics. I love her. Um, let's see if it works. I'm gonna try running it. Oh, it is asking me for my sudo password. So something matched. Let's see if the correct one matched. 
Yay, it's working. It's doing app-dish things. Yay. So one test on one system. Um, but for uh, I actually have uh, run this script on two systems now, so two successful tests. I have not tested it in OpenSUSE. I need to do that. All right. Uh, so since that script worked, um, why don't why don't we actually do a little bio break? Um, take three minutes um and uh make it five uh we'll take five minutes and then i'll move into the next problem where's my where's my pause thing i want to pause pause I re what i really want to do is pause the recording but i don't know how to do that oh here it is pause recording Resume recording and how do I resume screen sharing? Resume share, there we go. Okay, so now you guys should see my screen again. Yes? Yep. Okay, good. Uh, so, so problem number one is solved. Um, at least at least I think so. Um, I'm not going to save that. Uh, we're going to delete old logs. This is the second problem. But in order to handle this problem of deleting old logs, I have to create some old logs first. So I'm going to depend on a pattern that I use a lot. Uh, which is I always name my logs by ISO date. Uh, so the log will have some sort of a, a topic name, which in this case is just log. Um, and then it'll have an ISO date and then it'll be dot log generally. So depending on that pattern, um, my delete old logs is going to look something like this. And this, I, I have to admit that I trumped up one little part of it because I wanted to show you brace expansions. Um, so that little piece of it will be trumped up, but, um, or, or fakey, but the rest of it's pretty legit. But first I needed to solve the problem of how do I get a directory full of logs? Well, how about if I count from 365 days ago to today? How would I do that? Hmm. Um, I, and I started out with 10 days ago, by the way. So when you go to write your, your, your log maker, um, use, a, use a lower number than 365 so that you're not having to watch a whole ton of output while you're working through your bugs. Um, that was what I did. I started out with a week worth of logs and then I went to a year worth of logs as it got, uh, as my fakey log generator got better. Um, so I need a directory for logs. I found a secret to making directories to use dash P not only does it create intermediate directories if it needs it, it always succeeds as long as the directory either exists or it's able to create the directory. The only time makedir-p fails is when it's not able to create the directory, when the directory is needed and can't be created. So this is nice because it is like a, an item potent statement, create the directory. Um, it only fails if the directory is not there and can't be created. Uh, this keeps me from having to check to see if the directory is already in place. Um, and we haven't talked at all about this header. Uh, I wanna mention it really quickly. Uh, this is a bash programming class. The reason why we're using Bash over, say, Born Shell or some more portable set of features is 
I'm mostly automating for Linux, and I assume that you guys are mostly automating for Linux, and all Linuxes have Bash. Uh, if you are automating for Linux and Solaris and HPUX and True64, you're going to want to reduce the feature set that you use. And where, wherever I point out that I'm using something that's incompatible, like that shortcut redirector earlier, uh, you probably don't want to use it. All right, the, uh, the flags that I add to my invocation of bash are E for don't tolerate errors. Um, you don't want your script to be a bull in a china shop. You don't want it to run in, not find things as it expected, and then just keep trying to do stuff. Uh, I once wrote an optimistic script, which deleted all of my screenshots that were older than a week old. And when it found the screenshot directory missing one day, it optimistically continued to delete all of my data that was over a week old. Ever since then, I have written my scripts to be more cautious and to exit when they encounter unhandled errors. Save my bacon. Uh, the other bit of caution that I add to my scripts is this U. Uh, I want my scripts to exit if they ever encounter an unset variable. That's what that U is about. So uh, bash interpreter, this is me telling the bash interpreter, if I ever misspell a variable name and then I tell you to do something with that variable, fail. Quit out. Yes, Corey? Um, it's a, it's a special, this is called a shebang. Um, yep. Uh, so a shebang is at only at the head of a, a, an interpreted script and all it does is call its own interpreter and it calls its interpreter according to that line. So shebang is, a, is at the top of an interpreted script and it invokes its interpreter. Um, so during this class, we'll only be doing bash programs, but that, pa that shebang also works with Ruby and Python and every other interpreted language. You can, oh, and corn shell, the beautiful corn shell uh, and, and seashell and uh, all that stuff. Um, by the way, you guys don't have to have your cameras on if you don't want to. You can you can uh, you can turn them uh, off. If you want to show your faces, you can. If you don't, that's that's okay too. Um, and if you have a really cool avatar, uh, you can upload that to Zoom, and um, and then your avatar will show when your camera's not on. Um, I have a really cool avatar. It's me teaching. Uh, okay. So anyway, this is, this is the shebang with which I invoke all my bash programs and it saves my bacon time after time after mistake after mistake. But uh, other people don't make mistakes and so they can, they can do without these switches. Um, all right, so this is uh, make the logs directory if needed, enter the logs directory. Now, if this fails, if it fails to enter the logs directory, it's gonna quit out. Yay, that's exactly what I wanted to do. I don't want it to create 365 example logs in whatever directory I happen to be sitting in. All right, the oldest log 365 days ago. Now I'm gonna create 365 days of fakey logs. I'm gonna use the seek exter sequence external program. I'm gonna start out at oldest log, which is what again? 365, and I'm going to count down by negative one to one. So I'm gonna go all the way to yesterday's log. One day ago would be yesterday. I'm gonna pipe the output of that sequence into while read. So while read allows me to go through this loop one loop at a time. The reason that I didn't use a four in was because I don't know what's the biggest set that I can hand to the four in. 
while read allows me to hand the things to read one at a time because read reads one at a time. So I, you can do that with very, very long sets. Um, if seek is new to you, um, let me show you how it works. So seek counts. Uh, if you don't tell it uh, where to count from and to, it automatically counts from one to whatever you gave it. You can have it count from two to five instead, and it'll count like that. Or if you need it to count backwards, you have to give it an increment. Um, let's go from 10 to 100 by tens, uh, or we could go from 10 to one by minus ones. All right, so that's what seek does. And then read, uh, well, let me see. Uh, yeah, no, that, that's, that's fine, actually. While will run a loop as long as the, the uh, can expression that comes after while returns true. Remember that true is zero, right? So read returns true whenever it successfully reads. And read, when it reads, can set the value of a variable. So in this case, I'll call my variable number. Since I'm in while, it's asking for subsequent lines. That's an automatic extender. Um, so is do, it automatically extends. Uh, automatic line extender. Um, double ampersand and double pipe are also automatic line extenders. And so something else, I can't call it to mind right now. In bash, whenever I'm using variables, uh, when I want to call the valid, when I want to set it, I name the variable without a dollar sign. When I want to call its value back out, I have to put a dollar sign in front of it. So all I did there was just read the, the things that sequence was uh, outputting, assign them to that variable one at a time, and then um, output them back. That just shows you how this loop runs. So I'm setting days ago with the read utility. And as long as that succeeds, this while loop will run. As soon as sequence stops outputting stuff for read to read, it'll fail and this while loop won't run anymore. Does that make sense so far? Okay, diving into the loop, um, we're gonna start at 365. We're gonna output 365 to the pipe. The pipe is gonna feed it to while, uh, not feed it to while, the pipe is gonna feed it to read. Read's gonna set days ago to 365. Read is going to return a zero to while, and we're going to enter the loop. Date string equals. Now we're going to use days ago. Now I could have I could have um, had one more step of step by step in here, but I chose to uh, do one. Um, I guess this is three steps. Um, I'm saying 365 days ago. And I'm passing that as the date argument, date equals argument right here to the date command. And I'm also passing this argument ISO to the date command so that the date command will output the date in ISO format. And then I'm putting that whole ISO formatted date into a new variable named date string. Let's do that at the command line. Date double dash ISO shows me the date in ISO format. Um, why do I love ISO formats uh, so much for date strings? Anybody know? Go, Corey. Uh, the numbers are in their most significant, the least significant. And that, it's easy to sort them out. They, right, it causes them to sort out correctly. Uh, they, they put themselves into nicely blocked uh, rows and they sort out alphabetically the way that they should sort numerically. So the dates and the alpha are the same sort order. Uh, 
So when you want to get an ISO date for another date, you have to say something like, seven days ago, fortunately it does take plain English expressions like that, and then say double dash ISO. So that's the date seven days ago. You can also do in two weeks and next Friday and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. Um, so, so now we've got an ISO for a year ago. File name is going to be log. Now, normally this would be the name of the utility that I'm logging from. I would stick, um, so I, I don't know whether I'm, maybe I'm patching the system and it would be patch-date.log. Uh, so normally I would call this job. Um, actually, I should probably change that to the word job. Um, but that would actually be a short description of the job that I'm logging for. Stick the date string in there and then call it .log because that's what it is, it's a log. I'm, I'm, now I'm into you guys' lab time and I'm really sorry about that. Uh, and finally, now that I have a file name, I'm going to touch that file. Now you guys know that touch creates files, but did you know that touch also sets timestamps on files? Did you know that you can feed it? Did you, did you know that you can not only use it to update the mod date to right now, you can give it an argument to set the mod date to a particular date. So you can say that file was last modified on some date. So this is where that's useful is if you're issuing software and you want all the files in that software to have exactly the same timestamp you go through and touch all those files and put them all to the timestamp, maybe the release time or date of your software. No. So we're reusing the date string to set that mod date on the log file. Uh, so we're touching the log. We're we're touching the log file to create it. I've lost everyone but Corey. My, uh, I didn't see the message. Apparently, that my battery was getting low, and so I'm rebooting. Oh no, nope, I'm back. I've lost Robert. Bummer. Well, I'm here, and that's what really counts. That's what that's what matters. We're just we're just gonna roll on. We're gonna roll right on. Um, hey, Robert's back! Yay! Okay, we're all we're we're all back together now. One one more time. The last thing that we're doing is creating the file and making its mod dates the date that it supposedly was created. So this should give me a fictional set of logs that I can use with my log cleaner upper. Let's uh, dive into the repo and see if it works. Um, notice that there's nothing up my sleeve. I don't even have any sleeves. Um, there is no logs directory. So I'm going to try to create old logs now. There's a pause, so that's encouraging. And I see a logs directory, and I see that it's 20K in size, so there's a chance that there's stuff in it. Look at that. I have fakey logs. Yay, fakey logs with appropriate um, file names and appropriate file dates as well. So my March 29th log looks as if it was created on March 29th. Okay, like magic. All right, so there's my fakey data creator thing. Um, Let's save that change because I want those to be named job, not log. Um, I'm 
quickly checking my log cleaner upper to make sure that it doesn't depend on the file name beginning with log, and it does not. Good. Um, I'm going to ramaraf my logs file. Ramaraf. Whoops. That was interesting. That should have. Hmm. Shouldn't that have given me an error? I don't know what it's doing. I don't know what it's doing. What is it succeeding at? It. Well, we'll, we'll wait. What, you're trying to remove cursively remove without being prompted anything starting log dash two zero one. But but I didn't add a star. I didn't I didn't glob. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just right. a file called log dash two zero one. Yeah, that's weird. What is that? Why is that succeeding? I don't know why that's succeeding. Well, the funny part is, is it's succeeding, but in the listed, it's still there. Yeah, but there's nothing to delete by that name, so that's weird. Right. So it's it's failing, but it's not failing. Well, it's succeeding. There it is. Cannot remove no such file directory. Why didn't you get that before? I don't know. If I, I think it's the R. No, it's the F. Oh, F is just do it and don't give me any feedback. Yeah. So don't do F because F is like not interactive, no feedback. Just do it. But it's or force it. Yeah. But it still shouldn't. It still should give you one and echo dollar. It should. It still should fail. It still should go. Yeah, I couldn't. Okay. Oh, wait, do, do the, uh, Interesting. Yeah, do the, do the uh, rm dash, uh, just rm dash r on that. Well, uh, okay. And now do echo dollar question mark. Is it one? It should be one. Yeah. yeah. So for some reason, the F is causing it to succeed even when it fails, which is, that's, that's undesirable behavior to me. Okay, so uh, I am gonna ramaraf my logs folder because I don't need it anymore. Uh, oh, let me get back into session one. I do, I, I do need it, but I want it to be generated by the latest version of that. Create old logs, there we go. And LL logs. Okay, so now I've got some example logs. Now I'm gonna clean up those logs. And then we're going to, um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to do a delete old logs, but my delete old logs does some stuff and, and we'll, I'm going to run it. I'm going to show you its results and then I'm going to step through exactly how it does it and why, um, why I think it makes sense. All right. So uh, delete old logs is absurdly verbose. It dived into the old logs directory. Yep, there it is. There it is. Finally, there's the delete old logs running. Um, it renamed the log from the first of the month to keep. For every first of the month log, it named it to keep. Then it deletes all the logs from September and all the logs from October and all the logs from, whoops, where we go. Uh, and all the logs from January through February, uh, for, through March, that is, I'm sorry. Um, then finally, uh, this is, this. yeah, finally, no, almost finally, 
it lists and deletes every log file that's over a month old. And then finally, it shows what it what still remains. So this is what still remains. This is a month of logs plus all the logs from the first of each month, which seems to me like an intelligent way to clean up log files. Um, at, at least the, the final result is intelligent. I did some hokey things because I wanted to show you some globbing and some brace expansion in the script. Um, but the final result seems intelligent to me. I still want to keep some of those older logs at large intervals, but the small interval logs, I only want the recent ones for those. Does that seem reasonable? Does that seem like a reasonably logical way to clean up log files? Okay, good. So, so my example is a little bit, uh, a little bit created for teaching, but it's um, not entirely uh, fictionalized. So the, um, I'm again using a while read. So first of all, I'm jumping into the log folder. I'm using a while read again. This time I'm looking for all of the logs from the first of the month. Because they'll be named that, right? They'll be named dash 01.log because of the way that we named them with ISO dates. And then I'm going through them with while read. I don't know how many of these there will be. So that's why I'm using while read to go through them one by one again. Um, if I have a small set, I use, I'll use for in. If I have a large or indefinite set, I'll use while read. And I'm sure we'll, uh, in some later class, we'll uh, get to use for in for something. All right. Uh, this is where I'm renaming the ones from the first to dot keep. And the next one, I want to remove all the logs for September and October using a brace expansion glob pattern. This is a little bit hokey, but I wanted you guys to see how brace expansions work. The brace expansion is what gives me, um, and actually we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk about the glob uh, too. Let me talk about the glob first and then I'll come back for the brace expansion. What does a star match in a glob? Zero or more characters. Any number of characters, including space. Any number of characters, including space. Zero or more. So, um, zero or more characters. Technically, what I should have done was four question marks here because question marks match what? One character, exactly one character, any one character. So I should have demanded at least four characters at the beginning here, but, um, but I didn't do that actually. Four question marks, it, it doesn't actually matter because what the four question marks preceded or followed by an asterisk demand is four or more characters. So that matches four or more characters. And what I've done now is I've changed it to a dash for the, for the job there. And so this splat will only ever match the job name. Um, so the four question marks match the year, the two question marks match the day, the dashes only match literal dashes. So that's what I get on the glob. Now this brace expansion expands into 09 and then expands into 10. Brace expansions are iterated. They're not globbed. They're not a matching pattern. They're an iterator. Let me show you the difference. Um, Echo log dash. Um, this is actually log there doesn't matter. How do you use the glob brace for like the dash or the for in? Like, how do you, if there's two numbers in the glob brace, how do you 
Notice that it iterated through A, B, and C, the, the log command, or the, I'm sorry, the echo command iterated through A, B, and C. That's not a pattern matcher. The brace expansion is an iterator. You can do it with ranges. So like earlier, I used the seek, uh, sequence command to generate a sequence of numbers. You can do the same thing with brace expansion by using that little range operator there. And if I wanted, you can do it with anything as long as you use the comma operator instead. So we can go through our names. So remember that brace expansion is not a glob, it's an iterator. You can use it nested and multiplicatively. Uh, this is gonna be ugly, brace yourselves. So what did we get? We got 12 of them, right? Because it was four names times three different numbers. You can nest them. Uh, so you could say we need three Corys. Yeah, let me do this. But only one of each of those other guys. All right, so that's brace expansion. Um, and uh, earlier we did another one that was that was uh, an expansion um, command substitution. Let me go back to create a little logs for a second. Remember this create command substitution. This is just like the older way of doing it, where you did it with the back ticks, but back ticks don't nest. Using use this new way of doing it, and you can nest those. All right. So let me get back to the delete old logs. So this deletes all of the logs from September and October. I wanna delete all of the logs from January to March. This is a glob. It is not a brace expansion, it's a glob and it matches the numbers between one and three in one character position. So a question mark matches any, whoops, a question mark matches any single character, a square bracket pattern, like a square bracket pattern in a regex matches one character within its range or within its list. You can, you can do a list in there too. Um, so that's a glob. Uh, let me get that. I want to get those question marks in there. The more specific you make your patterns, the less likely you are to cry at some future time when your pattern is overly, um, uh, when it gathers too much stuff, especially if you're removing by a pattern. All right. So um, these two are fictionalized examples. I would never do this when I'm cleaning up. Um, uh, in real life. So these two are fiction, just to show you some globbing and brace expansion. This is how I would really do it. I use find, I find old logs, I find logs older than a certain uh, whatever it is that I want to keep that that fine grained logging for, and I get rid of them. You can just there's a dash to leave it means that that's part of find and then remove it. Yep. Yep. So you don't have to do that dash rm, you know, screw, brace, screw, brace, slash, you, so right. business anymore. Yeah, you don't have to do an exec. Um, so you could do it. Yeah. Another way to delete would be to use exec rm curly pattern that. Um, you don't have to do that. You can just use delete. Um, as long as you're working on files, it's easy. As long as you're working on empty directories, it's easy. If you're, if you're working on recursive trees, it's not so easy and you have to do a little bit of fancy dancing, um, but delete for files is perfect. Uh, and you always want to use the smallest hammer that will do the job.
always, always. Uh, so this is my cleaner upper. Um, if this was a real cleaner upper, I wouldn't have put these two pieces in there, but I think that they're really good at exemplifying when and how you might use um, very narrow filters and uh, brace expansions. So um, that's the cleaner upper. You've already seen what the cleaner upper does. Um, I would actually, if I was croning this cleaner upper, I would actually log the cleaner upper as well. So that if the cleaner upper is too greedy one day and cleans up stuff that it shouldn't have, I'll have some sort of a log that kind of maybe hopefully indicates why it failed. Um, unfortunately, my demo ran really, really long. So um, I'm going to open the lab at this point. I'd like you guys to try to get a, try to solve what you can of the uh, problems that we have, or if you have some other problem that you wanna work on that has come to mind as, as I've been doing the demo, then go ahead and work on that. At 8.15, I'm gonna call for outros where we will do show and tell or questions again. My hope is that I'll get really good questions, um, either about the material for that we had today or about things that you wanna see in a future session. We have three more sessions together. If there's things that you wanna hit during this bash programming class, I intentionally kept the participant to teacher ratio very low. I don't know if you noticed that, but I capped it at just six people because I want this to be boutique. I want this to be exactly the bash programming class that you want. And in order to best serve your individual needs, I kept it, the number of participants nice and low so that you can say, you know, I really wanted to learn about um, signaling or IO channels or whatever, and we'll be able to dive into exactly what you want. You now have 19 minutes to practice. Practice your butts off. And I still have no sound. On now, and uh, we're we're ready to we're ready to begin the sharing window, um, and outros ready to rumble. All right, and Jimmy Dak, I'm going to call on you, and then you're going to call on somebody else. All okay. right, same thing as before. Say hi. My name is Bob and do a show and tell or ask a question hi my name is bob it's actually rich or jimmy dack my question is i would like to be able to use bash scripting um, as a means to extract data from uh from markup files like xml where you have all these tags and keys and all this other gobbledygook and um, without, you know, piping it through a whole lot of seds and ox and graphs, I'd like to maybe find a more elegant way to use bash to find data that I'm looking for in something like XML or HTML or something that's not just, or well, something that's a little less nice than like comma separated or whatever. Uh, nice text files. Did that make sense? Okay, that's that's my question. All right. Oh, okay. We're not getting an answer now. I'm just passing it. I thought I was going to get a quick, like, two second answer. Here's how you do it. Done. Okay. Um, I am going to pass it to Corey. Yeah, you can't pass it to Robert. He's muted. Okay. Um, uh, it, it, this is a great class. I'm digging it, definitely. Um, 
my biggest interest right now is I want to uh, take some more time and play with the uh, um, auto update of Linux. I'd like to kind of uh, clean it up and use it, ex or not clean it up, but tune it to do exactly what I need it to do at uh, my particular installation. I would like to definitely do some more error test or not error trapping, but testing for versions of Linux and then do the update based on that. My question is, is in the automated process, if I can skip certain packages, I have one particular server in mind that if I touch anything on Tomcat, it breaks it. So I can update everything but Tomcat. So that will be my question. And since I can't pass it to Robert, I'm going to uh, pass it back to Mr. Wilson. Okay, so that's a wrap for us today, unless Robert has a functioning mic. You don't, do you? Okay. Um, and uh, it's been wonderful meeting with you. Um, the, uh, the questions were pretty detailed. So I'm going to ask that they get turned into issues in the Bash Programming Project Repository. Uh, and ideally with um, screenshots or pastes or representative data um, that I can use as I try to work up at least prototype solutions to the problems that you want to solve. Um, and no problem is too small. Obviously, some problems are going to be too large for Bash. They're not going to be well suited to Bash. Um, uh, complex data is not good for Bash, but not every HTML document or every XML document um, is complex data. Some of that data is relatively flat and, and we're able to draw meaningful inferences even with as primitive a tool as Bash. Uh, but, but the thing about um, version pinning, that's a great problem. Uh, we can, and we absolutely can do that. So I look forward to meeting you guys again next week. Um, all the people that are enjoying this in recorded form, I hope that this has been uh, fun to listen to. Um, and we'll be back on April 25th. Uh, and we'll, we'll stick to this same cadence. We'll take 15 minutes to gather. We'll do show and tell and Q&A for about 15 minutes. I'll talk about some concepts and then I'll walk through some code and then you'll get a chance to practice and then we'll do show and tell and Q&A for about 15 minutes and then we'll adjourn. Um, I hope everybody else had as much fun as I did. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you.